Coming up on Stu Does America, there aren't any candidates left in the race. Everyone is dropping out. There will be no one on the ballot in any state. Or at least it feels that way. What does all this mean for Super Tuesday and the 2020 election? Andy No discusses the future of Antifa and left-wing violence. But I mean, honestly, what does it even matter if we're all going to die from coronavirus anyway? We have the latest updates and what you definitely should not do to stop the spread. Remember, if we're going to be quarantined for weeks on end anyway, you're definitely going to need a lot of YouTube videos to watch. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can see all of the episodes, plus get notifications for every new one by clicking the fancy bell. Plus, listen wherever you get your podcasts and please rate five stars and review. Suggest a text. It's great. Whatever. So many people have written that phrase, they've actually made t-shirts of it. You can get one at stewdoesmerch.com. They're great. Whatever. They apparently don't want me telling you that this t-shirt will protect you from coronavirus, but I'd like to see them stop me. This new t-shirt will protect you from... You know, Bernie Sanders already has himself a comic book. What about Joe? This weekend, Joe Biden had his own superhero performance. What kind of crappy superhero comes in fourth in Iowa, fifth in New Hampshire, and second in Nevada by 26 points? Well, he's not exactly Batman, Batman. He's not even really Robin. Joe Biden was more of Robin's transgendered cousin, Robinette. Mmm, yes, Robinette, which conveniently happens to be Joe Biden's middle name, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. Seriously, this has led, uh, led to some legitimately funny headlines like this. Joe Biden's middle name is Robinette. We've identified this person's middle name. That's some journalism for you. Find out how you can avoid naming your kid Robinette tonight at 11. Rarely do you get a news headline that just literally states what your middle name is. And while it's true that Joe Biden somehow, somehow had the worst middle name on a presidential ticket where the other guy's middle name was Hussein, Robinette is actually a great name for the superhero representation of Joe's performance. It's possible you might not take a superhero seriously if they happen to be an 80-year-old transgendered man wearing a skin-tight onesie, but you would be mistaken. First of all, the other superheroes all look ridiculous, too. I don't know if you've noticed this. They're wearing their underwear on the outside of their clothing. And I'm pretty sure most of them are just copying Joe Biden anyway, who has been around a lot longer. Plus, I know I have seen him at some rallies donning Depends on the outside of his slacks. It's a good look. If you've been watching the show for a while, you've been hearing me mention that the polling data started to move dramatically towards Robinette late last week and indicated the possibility of a big-time victory. And that's just what happened. Uh, Robinette has been running for president since 1988, and he has finally won a state. Yes! Good job, everybody. We did it. Amazing. Robinette picked up 48.4% of the vote, beating up on the communist crusader Bernie Sanders by 28 points. In third place was the universe's least interesting billionaire, wealth disposal man, Tom Steyer, who finished with 11.3%. While we're on Steyer uh, for a second, he's been spending so much of his money that his ads kept running even after he dropped out. And I, I don't want to be awkward here, but today's show is brought to you by Tom Steyer 2020. If you're looking for a candidate that can make you forget about voting through sheer boredom, then look no further than Tom Steyer. If you like your billionaires without accomplishment, notoriety, or friends, then you need to jump on board the Steyer Express to Dullesville. If you're looking for the result, I mean, I want you to really think about it. If you're looking for the result of what would happen if oat milk turned into a politician, Tom Steyer is the one for you. And if you're looking to cast a vote for someone who has the name you didn't know three months ago and a face you won't remember three months from now, then you're talking Tim or Tom Steyer for president because of reasons and stuff. Just think of what a monumental failure this is. 
He started a petition in October of 2017 to get Trump impeached. He's been throwing money at activist organizations for years to set up this run. And then he spent something like a quarter of a billion dollars of his own money. And remember, Steyer isn't a Bloomberg level billionaire. He's barely a billionaire at all. He's only worth $1.6 billion, which is like bragging that you make more than minimum wage when you're making like $7.85 an hour. Yes, it's technically true, but relax, your apron is dirty. Steyer spent something like 15% of all of his money on this race, including far more than anyone in South Carolina, and he got exactly zero delegates. None. None delegates. None personality. None delegates. While Steyer and Bloomberg are currently in the middle of completely disproving the Democratic talking point about rich people buying elections, to be fair, no amount of cash can buy you out of this. <laughs> Steyer still finished ahead of Buttigieg at 8% and Warren at 7%, plus Klobuchar at 3% and Tulsi Gabbard at 1.3%, who at this point is just running to piss people off. After the results came in, former Mayor Pete jumped into a phone booth and converted to former candidate Pete. The guy won Iowa and finished a close second in New Hampshire and couldn't even get to Super Tuesday. Of course, Pete is playing the long game here. Unlike the collection of depreciating 90-year-olds in this race, Buttigieg has a future beyond next week's dialysis appointment. Bailing on the race before he likely gets smoked on Super Tuesday saves him the embarrassment, and his endorsement does a big favor to our hero, Robinette. Not to mention, Joe Biden might want the first openly gay vice presidential nominee on his ticket. Plus, political science experts believe that the most successful campaigns try to have at least one person who can speak the English language and who isn't averaging three strokes per campaign appearance. Now, Amy Klobuchar, a.k.a. the Staple Slinger, it's a pretty good one, has been aiming for the VP slot since the beginning of this mess. She's also announced she's dropping out and endorsing Joe Biden. Even the star of the Nightmare Before Christmas, Harry Reid, has bravely... <laughs> has bravely endorsed Biden one week after the primary where he actually had influence. Good job, Harry. You're so brave. There was a, a famous political science book that came out in 2008 called The Party Decides. The premise being, you know, vote all you want, you, you peasants. But in the end, primaries are decided in smoke-filled rooms among party officials. This was followed up by Donald Trump winning the nomination, so it hasn't worked out perfectly well. But the Democratic Party still seems to do a lot of deciding. And make no mistake, this is the clearest example of the party deciding we have seen in a long time. The party wants Biden. An amazing and sad admission. I've been telling you for a while that this race shapes up like this. Biden gets his last stand in South Carolina to be the non-Bernie option. If he fails there, it's just Bloomberg in the way of Sanders because he can just keep spending money and money and money and money without worry. Well, Robinette showed his superpowers by not just winning South Carolina, but, but divide, just completely devouring everybody else like they were an all-you-can-eat buffet of different varieties of cream of wheat. So he's back in the game, at least for right now. Bernie still leads the delegates with 56, and Biden has 48. In a stunning development, the party that has been bitching about the rules since November 6, 2016 because the winner of the Electoral College was not the same as the winner of the popular vote has exactly the same thing happening when they make the rules themselves from scratch. Bernie leads in the delegate count, but it's Biden who is winning the popular vote by about five points. So what's next? Uh, I think the Biden win was honestly big enough, along with Klobuchar and Buttigieg endorsements and dropping out, to move a lot of last minute votes from Bloomberg to Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. That should be uh, enough positive to overwhelm the negative poison of a Harry Reid endorsement. With the field cleared for Biden, the pressure is on Warren to drop out and help Bernie. And that must be intense. I mean, if Biden can perform Tuesday, you might see Bloomberg, a uh, superhero name, El Bloombito, start running a lot more anti-Sanders ads instead of commercials praising himself. I mean, he'll still be making the self-praise commercials. He'll just be playing them in his private plane to himself instead of airing them publicly. Remember, Robinette is a pretty crappy superhero, and he needs a lot of help. 
Tomorrow during this time, we will be here uh, giving you all the results and analysis you need on Super Tuesday, injected directly into your veins like your Bernie Sanders supporting Antifa member, just right into the veins. And remember, tomorrow night's Super Tuesday election coverage on The Blaze is brought to you by Tom Steyer for president. Tom Steyer is a man who cares. Tom Steyer is a man who cares enough to know when it's time to apologize. So Tom would like to announce that he is sorry to his friends, his family, and anyone else who has come in contact with over the past couple of years. Some of them could have inherited the quarter of a billion dollars he set on fire during this campaign, including the thousands of dollars he spent on this particular ad, which is airing after he dropped out of the race. For just $36 a month, you can sponsor a child in Africa. For what he spent on this campaign, Tom Steyer could have sponsored 7 million children in Africa. But honestly, eh, you know, which is better? Neither one is enough to get Tom Steyer a delegate, so who cares? Tom Steyer, rich enough to frequently tell you how great he is, morally bankrupt enough to do just that. I'm Tom Steyer, and I approve this message. Who does America? So my wife is completely freaked out about the coronavirus. Uh, and it sucks, man, because, uh, you know, it's one of those things where the media has been going crazy on this for weeks and weeks and weeks. It's built up. It's built up. And it's it's scary. I mean, they, they the people are dying. We're talking about infection level things. You see people being locked in their homes in China and trapped on cruise ships and quarantine for weeks on end. And it is pretty scary. Plus, you've got the markets crashing, although bouncing back pretty strongly today. What are you supposed to think about coronavirus? Um, I think one of the things the media has done very poorly is explain, hey, you know, you shouldn't really worry about dying here, most likely. There is a chance, of course, of something happening, um, but it shouldn't freak you out to the, the, the point that you're really changing your life. Um, there's a good chance you're going to get coronavirus, uh, maybe not this year, maybe next year or the year after. Eventually, it's probably going to hit you. And again, coronavirus is just the name of a, a large group of viruses this COVID-19 is the specific one here. It's new to us. It's new to us. Somebody, I don't know. We, we don't know exactly how it happened. Maybe somebody had bat soup. We don't know. It sounds delicious, uh, but if it leads to something like this, you probably don't want to do it. A couple things to run down about this. I think we're worrying about the wrong things here. First of all, is it going to affect you? Well, are you worried about the flu? If you're worried about the flu, then you probably wouldn't be worried about this. And we should be worried about the flu. It does a lot of things. But right now, uh, the, the regular old flu has about a 0.1% uh, death rate. The media is promoting this 2% death rate for coronavirus, COVID-19. While that's technically true, particularly inside of China, we all know there is literally no way that rate is going to hold up. It is not going to hold up. I would be willing to do the Mitt Romney on stage at a debate thing. I will bet you $10,000 that it does not come down to a 2% death rate when this thing is all said and done. It, you know, they have not identified how many people have it. They believe now in Washington there has been cases being passed around for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, and we've had now a total of five deaths here in America, and we're going to have more. I mean, this is not going to be pretty. That being said, the, the rate is going to be nowhere near 2% that actually get it. We think maybe there could be hundreds, maybe thousands of people who have already been exposed out of this group in which five people wound up dying. Um, so this is going to come down. You're going to hear that scary rate. It's already down at a 0.7% outside of Wuhan. Now, I don't know about you. I do have three timeshares inside of Wuhan, so it's a little worrisome. Um, but if you don't, you're probably going to be okay there. Um, what's more interesting to me is not that we're freaking out too much about coronavirus, is that we don't freak out enough about the flu. 32 million cases of flu have happened in the United States this year. 32 million. And there have been 18,000 deaths. Now, 18,000 sounds like a lot. You might notice that about six 9-11s. Kind of a big deal. However, usually that number, and it's one of the most incredible statistics that I cannot believe is actually true, but is. Uh, sometimes over 60,000 people in a year, I believe it was 2018, was 60,000 people died uh, from the regular good old flu. That seems like a health priority. Uh, I think we should try to do whatever we can to try to uh, improve that number. What's scary about uh, coronavirus is we don't have treatments yet for it and we don't have um, a vaccine. 
Now, a lot of you might not take the vaccine. About half of people don't take the vaccine. I usually get it every year, honestly. Um, it does, it's not perfect. It doesn't work perfectly every single year, but it does lower your chance of getting the flu. And the flu can be deadly, mostly for people who are elderly or are infirmed already or infants. Uh, but it can help hit anybody. It killed somebody who was in their 20s uh, that I read about just the other day, the regular old flu. Coronavirus is not to that level yet, but we should really be attacking these things with everything that we have because it is pretty bad. Um, finally, someone in, in the world of journalism came up with a reason to talk to someone who actually is suffering from coronavirus, which has been something that hadn't really been done yet. The Washington Post did it. Carl Good, uh, Goldman wrote the story. Uh, this is what the uh, person says who has uh, the uh, virus. I believe that is Carl. Says, I'm in my late 60s. It's the sickest I've ever been is when I had bronchitis several years ago. That laid me back uh, on my back for a few days. This one has been much more easy. No chills, no body aches. I breathe easily. I don't have a stuffy nose. My chest feels tight and I have coughing spells. If I were at home with similar symptoms, I probably would have gone to work as usual. Uh, they caught the virus on the uh, cruise ship. Uh, was quarantined for 14 days at the end of a 16-day cruise. Um, felt fine when they left the ship. Went on to say, at the hospital campus, they put me in a bio uh, containment unit. Two cameras watch me at all times. The room has last been used for the Ebola breakout of 2014. That's, I, I think you just burn those rooms, don't we? Do we really keep reusing Ebola rooms? Um, I gotten someone used to the idea that I might catch the virus. My wife, however, tested negative. I like this. After those days being cooped up on the ship together, I think we were both relished the alone time. This guy was happy he was quarantined. I don't know what, what that says about their relationship, but... Uh, if I'm saying, you know what, I'm glad I'm in a booth with the Ebola virus for a few weeks, I think maybe my marriage is in trouble. Uh, the time has passed more quickly than I would have expected. With my laptop, I can get as much work done as I can remotely. I catch up with friends. I take walks about my room, trying to get a thousand more steps in each day. I also watch the news. It's surreal to see everyone panic about a disease virus that I have. Uh, the, so he's actually not that worried about it. And look, it's not going to hit most people. A lot of people aren't going to even know that they have symptoms which is pretty crazy. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting is this media sort of backlash on the coronavirus. People are, because it's Trump related, they want to call it the Trump virus. They want to say Trump's at fault for it. Mike Pence was on with Chuck Todd, and I thought an amazing exchange happened. Watch closely at the tactic by Chuck Todd. I will tell you, there's been a lot of irresponsible rhetoric among Democrats and commentators. Who? Who is this? On the left. Name some names, sir. Well, uh, because this is just, uh, it just feels like gaslighting. P please name some names. I'm, I'm a, we're all big. Well, we're all big people here. Name some names. There was a column in the New York Times that's, uh, that by a prominent liberal journalist that said uh, we should rename it the Trump virus. Okay, that, that, that is, does that apply, to, does that apply to, to all people? So that the president would be blamed. Chuck, this, this apply, virus I mean, began in China. Why take this? The Here's what I ask you. Took, uh, this doesn't Chuck, help. This, this does not help decisive us, no? action yeah. to protect the American people. And, uh, and when, when you see voices on our side, pushing back on outrageous and irresponsible rhetoric on the other side. I think that's important and I think it's justified. You gotta love that tactic there. Basically like, I need an example, give me an example. I want some example, give me some example. And then he lists a very prominent one. But you could obviously go on and name a million contributors at MSNBC who've done the same thing. Uh, you can talk about people tweeting and all that. But to find a New York Times column said we should change this to the, to the Trump virus, well, does that apply to everyone? Well, no, it doesn't apply to everyone, but you asked for an example. Here, here it is. There's plenty of examples of this. We know that this is an inappropriate way to handle something like this, but here's, here's another tweet. This one is, uh, for, I don't know this guy's name, but uh, here we go. Uh, Thomas Charlton Williams says, Mike Pence and his Corona uh, emergency team praying for a solution. We are so screwed. I mean, when you talk about there being bias in the media, this is clear. Look, Trump has to do a good job. If he doesn't do a good job, the economy is going to collapse and he's not going to be president anymore. Um, he needs to make sure this is handled competently and he's put his number two guy in charge of it. The bottom line here, though, is while media bias isn't the most important thing here, it is important because if people don't have the facts, they can't handle it properly themselves. Back in a second. Dan Andros is the managing editor at Faithwire.com. He's also the most current winner of the official Senator Ernie Velveeta Lookalike Contest. Every year, tens upon tens of people compete. It's really a highly coveted award, and who wouldn't want to look like the handsome? Do we have that picture again? The handsome devil, Ernie Velveeta. You look almost identical 
to this guy. I mean, look at this. I mean, with the exception of the hair and the fact that he dresses a lot cooler than you. I mean, this is almost identical, Dan. Wow. Wow. I mean, I, 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 I'm still on a high from that, that great <laughs> honor. I mean, let me tell you. So let me ask you this. Um, are you in a position where your family or you yourself are freaking out over coronavirus uh, like my family is? Uh, well, first of all, I want to say that I'm not a doctor mm -hmm. um, at all. And so don't take this advice uh, from me in case you were thinking about doing that. But no, I'm not freaked out at all. Really? Actually. Uh, uh, yes. Are you I, aware how yeah. many people, 25 million people are going to die next week from coronavirus and you're not even freaked out? Next week? Yeah. Is that right? Well, I was living in Dallas when Ebola came and, you know, that had me a little freaked out because that seemed a little more like flesh eating type thing like this, you know, where I, I mean, I keep reading here that, you know, you have a unless you're old or you're sick, like you're, you, you know, you, you're going to get coronavirus and not even know it. Like, I'm, I mean, I'm not brushing it off. I'm not like just going to be, you know, going out and like, you know, licking street signs or something, but like, um, you know, to, mm -hmm. but I'm, you know, I'm the, not worried about it. The only all. place to lick street signs is Willy Wonka's uh, candy factory. There it's okay. Right. right. Nowhere else. Yeah. It, don't think about how many people have toured the facility or how many Oompa Loompas have gone by that particular sign. Right. Just, just let that go. <laughs> right. um, the, it, what's interesting yeah. about the coronavirus is I think it all, is all a, um, it, it is serious, obviously, as far as a global problem, as is the regular freaking flu, by the way. Um, but in addition, I think it's the it's the media sort of hype on it where there are certain incidents that the media picks up and it makes it feel like there is this constant pressure on you and you, your life is at stake. And they get some length, you know, they get some nice, uh, you know, bird flu was like this uh, where they get a decent amount of publicity and they get they get the ratings and then they kind of forget it. And we all kind of say, hey, remember when there was the bird flu or the Y2K thing or whatever was. Uh, last on the on the roster of of scary events, uh, this is really, while it's still a serious issue, a big media problem more than it is perhaps a health threat to the average person. Yeah, it's really kind of scary how the media can dictate what everyone's <laughs> freaking out about and what they're not freaking out about. But I think that there's a tendency here, uh, Stu, on this particular issue too. Um, like, let's not forget about media bias, and so. You know, the, the, the media has been clamoring for something, anything that will make Trump just, you know, get booted out of office or lose the election or whatever it is. So whether intentional or not, whether it's just a combination of, well, they, they think they need to cover this thing or not. I, I think I think you'd, you'd be kidding yourself if many of these reporters are not thinking like, hey, here's our chance to to really, uh, you know, go all in on this thing and make Trump look bad. I mean, they were already complaining about Mike Pence's response. I mean, the guy they, they were typing up the press release that Mike Pence was heading up the task force and everyone's complaining about his response already. I'm like, the guy barely didn't even know he was he was doing it yet. And you're yelling at his response. Right. And they put, you know, the, his number two, it's vice president in charge. I mean, you know, he's not a scientist, but he is an administrator. His job is I, they, I don't understand how they don't see the, the separation there. Um, speaking of Pence, though, I, I want to go to this tweet where he's being mocked. Uh, do we have the tweet here um, that we can see? Because he, Pence is, is being mocked here. It says Mike Pence and his coronavirus emergency team praying for a solution. We are so screwed. It's, it strikes me as like a real dividing line among Americans here because, you know, I, most people I've known in my entire life would say that's a totally normal thing to do when it comes to a massive health threat to pray. That doesn't that's not all you do. You don't just pray and don't right. try to come up with a vaccine. But, you, you know, praying is, right. is, is a part of it. And it's the most important part if you're if you're a Christian and you believe in these things. And then the other side, it's such an absurd act to close your eyes and bow your head and pray to the magical sky god that they can't even see the other side of this. How, is that how you see it? And, and how do you even bridge that divide? Yeah. Well, this is becoming a common trope among the uh, among the left, I guess, um, because they do the same thing on the gun issue. You know, when someone says after a shooting, they, they offer thoughts and prayers or, or we're praying, you know, they're like, well, geez, thanks a lot. But, you know, why don't you pass this? gun bill that I have, you know, as if somehow there's this magical formula that's sitting over here on the desk and the Republicans just don't want to do it because they would rather just pray and hope. And it's like, that's not, you know, they're, they're not mutually exclusive things here. Like you can pray and also do stuff. So, um, so I think it's, I, I've never understood why it's not, um, I mean, 
I really under, I understand why, because I, I think there's a lot of, I mean, look, the, the white male evangelical Christian is boogeyman number one in America today. Um, but, I, but in reality, um, anyone, whether you're a believer or not, should take a prayer as, as you should appreciate it. Because even if you don't believe, like when someone tells me, Hey Dan, you know, like I'm sending good vibes your way. Well, I don't believe in vibes can do anything and that you can personally <laughs> send me vibes that right. will actually do anything. But I appreciate the fact that you're you're, you care about me and you're thinking about me. Like, I appreciate that. So I don't understand why, you know, the people on the left can't do the same thing with prayer. And really the mutually exclusive part of this is, is a really good point. I mean, you know, we can all pray for good health and we do. However, we can also wash our hands. Right? Like these are not mutually exclusive yeah. things. This isn't some magic trick. You just go in there and you, and you do both because you believe in both. Um, if you don't believe in one of the two, uh, you know, you don't have to do it, but I would recommend both. I think they're both <laughs> complementary things. Um, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this because the left tends to use faith at very specific times, just like, you know, they, they tend to use libertarianism when, when, it's, when it suits them. Oh, well, well you know, we don't want the government involved in decisions with a woman and, and, and her body. They're libertarian for that one issue, and then they're off that kick. Same thing with faith. It seems like uh, AOC was attempting this uh, trick, trying to communicate God only knows what with one syllable words. Here she is uh, talking uh, about, I mean, I guess the holy nature of life. It is part of my faith that all people are holy and all people are sacred unconditionally. Hmm. I, I mean, she's trying hard there. She's certainly reading it. Yes. But I mean, the fact that she's even reading, she's at the third grade level now, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> how do you, I mean, how do you even answer well, something like that? Well, well, first of all, I mean, for starters, that's interesting theology there to say that, that man, every man is holy. I mean, I think the exact opposite is true. I mean, anyone who's read a Bible would read about the condition of man and sin. We all know about Adam and Eve and the apple and that's sin. We're all sinful. We, we do things that, you know, uh, go against God's law and the only one who's holy is God. So I'll, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt here and say, assume that she was saying that all people are valuable. Um, and, but the, of course, then she runs into another issue with that statement because as she's, you know, going on and on about how, you know, you know, all these Republican talking points about, uh, you know, we wouldn't put people in cages. Jesus wouldn't do that. Um, we, we care about all people. And she even says children later on in this. And it's like, you know, you're, you can't help but think about the unborn. Here's this, the same woman who's talking about, you know, uh, abortion, like shout your abortion type, type rhetoric. And yet she's sitting here saying, you know, invoking faith and Jesus to talk about, uh, how Republicans don't care about all people. It seems pretty darn inconsistent. And I think one of the most bothersome parts about it is it's like it's one thing to not be a believer. You know, and look, you got to make that choice on your own. But when you just, you know, opportunistically bring it into your yeah. uh, political commentary once every six months <laughs> to try to justify yeah. whatever terrible thing you're about to attempt, that's maybe the most bothersome thing uh, that happens in government. Yeah. And that's that it does bother me. That's it's very disingenuous when you look at it, when you because they're not. I mean, the way I look, I'm not going to judge people's hearts, but the way this comes across to me is um, and the left does this a lot where they just seem to throw out, you know, um, biblical values and, and what what it actually means until they think they can make like a, a slam dunk point. I'm going to dunk on Republicans here and say, see, if they were, you know, if they really cared about it. I mean, they do the same thing with abortion. Well, if you were really pro-life, like the Bible says, you'd care about you know, uh, people after they were born. And it's like, you know, well, okay, that doesn't take away the fact that you're still killing people in the womb. So I don't, I don't see how that, but so I don't like the, the using it when it's convenient for them because it doesn't feel like it's genuine faith. It feels like they're just, um, you know, trying to make a political point with it. And stunningly, by the way, we actually do care after they're born. Um, two more quick things before yeah. we leave. Uh, one Sonic has a yeah. new Reese's overload, um, blast which combines the goodness mm. of Reese's peanut butter cups and Reese's pieces. Have you tried this? Uh, I have not. I'm unfortunately um, uh, in the area I live, there is not a convenient Sonic near me. Oh. So, uh, but I will have to uh, schedule a trip to go make a road trip to find this because it sounds absolutely amazing. Have you had it? It is unbelievable. And they really pack it in there too. Uh, I would highly recommend it <laughs> if you happen to be near a Sonic. And secondly, uh, Mountain Dew Zero. I have not had this yet. You have. What is your review? Yes. Uh, really good. 
really solid. I mean, as you know, I like all sodas, but um, this one, uh, it seemed really good. I mean, I couldn't taste a huge difference between Diet Mountain Dew, which is my go-to drink, yes. and Mountain Dew Zero, but uh, which is a good thing, right? I mean, we're getting no sugar, and you're still getting that good taste. So, well, look, I can do um, another. Surprisingly, this segment's not sponsored by Mountain Dew. I know. I don't understand that. Mountain <laughs> Dew, we're ready. Uh, I can do another 45, 50 minutes on this particular topic, but we have to call it from there. Dan and Andros from FaithWire.com and the Ernie Velveeto Award winner. Thanks for coming on the program. All right, thanks. Back in a second. Welcome back. Joining us now uh, is the editor at large of the Post Millennial, journalist, uh, and you know, a guy who has informed us, I think, more than anybody else, any single person, on the topic of the, the rising violence of the left. Uh, Andy No. Andy, welcome to the program. It's a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, you know, I mean, I gotta say that's, you know, thinking about that as I say it, it's like, I really can't come up with another name. I mean, if it, if it wasn't for you and the work you've done, which is super brave and I would, you know, I would never do it and uh, I'm a total wuss compared to you um, because you just stand in the middle of this and, you know, you've risked your life to be able to bring this to America and thank you for doing it. Well, thank you. I think one of the reasons why there's not a lot of journalists covering the, the topic of Antifa is because if you come at it from a critical perspective, as I do, because I think it's a violent extremist movement, um, you get smeared as uh, far right or sympathetic to neo-Nazis or anything. And uh, I think it points to the larger issue of how the media institutions have been captured by um, a lot of far left uh, or orthodoxy. You mentioned that they're, they're a violent uh, uh, extremist organization. And, and, and I, I don't even know what the argument against that is frankly. I, it, it seems like every single time they get together, it's not every single person, right? I mean, you can, you, you can say that about any movement, though. Uh, it's a large portion, larger than any other organization that I can think of, and continually in the same areas, uh, they are, in Portland in particular, they are continually um, bringing a, 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 a sort of a street movement uh, with levels of violence we haven't seen in a long time in this country. I, I, where do you, wh how do they push back against the, the reporting that you're doing? I think um, they push back because uh, what's happened after Trump's surprise election win in 2016 is that it's um, a lot of people have, I think, lost their moral compass, people that you expect to have um, to follow like the norms mm -hmm. of what it means to be American or a civilized person, you know, like not advocating political violence, not advocating violence as a solution to um, interpersonal conflict, um, but just in their reaction to uh, just that they cannot accept that this administration won democratically. Um, they've chosen to manifest their rage and anger through um, supporting political violence. Um, and you pointed out that it's, it's only a small number of people who are actually involved in property destruction, rioting, and violence against citizens. But they're empowered to do it because they can depend on uh, the local media, sometimes depending on where it happens, uh, even the, po the local population to excuse that type of extremist behavior. You know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I want to get into the what's coming with this as we get closer to the election, because I, I, you know, I think it could be really ugly. But one of the things I think, too, that particularly hits areas like Portland and why it's so common in Portland is it doesn't seem like anybody in the city government uh, cares. They almost seem to want to be encouraging uh, that this goes on, and they don't seem to be cracking down on it at all like they would any other group who did these types of things. Is that is that is that perception correct? I think it is per correct based on um, the things that people on city council have said and the policy decisions that they've chosen. I think the most chilling thing to have happened in Portland is how um, Portland police are uh, have had all pretty much all the tools taken away for effective crowd control. Uh, the framework that they operate from now is essentially passive policing. So if they find themselves to be, quote, an agitation to protesters, 
um, and of course the left-wing protesters will always say F the police, mm. then the police will actually physically remove themselves from the situation. And it's provided a blueprint over and over for um, violent radicals to know what to do to be able to commit criminal acts and get away with it. That's interesting. It's almost like a chicken and the egg situation. Like they didn't like the police anyway. Correct. But now the active dislike of the police, making it as public as possible, is actually helping them in the criminal investigation side of this. And whether it's you know they're going to be, uh, you know, cracked down on by the police. Um, I, I bring this up because I, I look at the future here a little bit, mm -hmm. and it seems like the manifestation of Antifa in a candidate, and I'm not saying he's endorsing what they're doing, but Bernie Sanders has, a, there's a lot of similarity there um, when it comes to the groups. Um, we've seen this with James O'Keefe and the work he's done, um, being able to expose some of these people in the campaign, and as far as I know, they're still working in the campaign. Yes, they are. It's a, that part of it, is, I almost hate to, I have to, let me stop there. How on earth is a guy who says, you know, we, we're going to burn the city down, we're going to kill people, we need gulags, Every other candidate would have at least fired them and said, oh, it's just a bad apple and, you know, we're moving on. And, of course, don't try to paint the whole campaign this way. How does Bernie get away with no pushback from the media from, from keeping these guys on board? Well, I think what this suggests is that the far left has made significant gains into the mainstream left to the point of where uh, the open espousal of these violent beliefs is not um, punished with ostracization. I think I personally found it quite disturbing that um, the campaign for Bernie Sanders, who is now the front runner, um, really protected these staffers. Mm. Uh, and you know, it's important that you went um, repeated some of the things that they said in, in these Project Veritas videos that were released last month. You know, expressing. Um, a desire to see political dissidents killed in a revolution, to be jailed. I mean, it, and this is not entirely just theoretical because we have the whole last century of all the totalitarian communist regimes who have actually enacted these um, these practices. So, um, it. I think we should be scared that the people who are who have the ear of Bernie Sanders, who work in his campaign espouse and have and harbor such extremist views and the fact that he hasn't come out to disavow and made his own position clear yeah. um, speaks a lot actually. It really does um, and, and it you see this you know from the level of uh, just online the way that you know the Bernie bros as they're always called which I hate that term because it's so friendly they, they just seem like they're buddies you're having a beer with them at the bar it's no big deal I mean they're really abusive to people including other Democrats online constantly um, and I, you look kind of into the future here, and as you say, Bernie's the front runner. But you know, the the chance of a brokered convention is a is a serious uh, a contested convention is a serious possibility. Um, he is the only one saying, well, if I have the plurality, I should definitely get the nomination. Everyone else, including him in 2016, disagreed with that position. Um, but if they go to this contested convention, let's just say, and you have Bernie Sanders who's leading in the delegate count but winds up losing the uh, nomination because of a contested convention situation, I mean, I can't even imagine what we see on the streets from the people who have been supporting Bernie in, in the ways that they're supporting him. Do you see, I mean, you've been in the middle of these things. Do you see that as a real possibility? So here's the thing. Um, with Bernie Sanders, I think... The fact that he is as popular as he is, particularly with young Americans, that is something to, that we need to reckon with as a society. And with what uh, the Democrat Inc. and DNC putting their finger on trying to um, stifle or hurt the campaign, Bernie's campaign, I think um, that's not good for this country because uh, you know, you can look back on 2015, 2016 and see establishment Republicans not liking the uh, populist tendencies of Trump and, you know, trying to influence that. You know, that makes a, the population feel like our voices are not being respected. Yeah. And so 
what I would hope to see is that you know the rules for the the DNC have already been laid out, so you don't you they, these are the rules that you agree to follow by. So you, um, let's see the process play out. But um, at the same time, this is a moment of introspection for the Democrat Party. Like, who um, who who are are you guys yeah. really? And which voice are you going to? Um, and you know the DNC is not entirely innocent of the radicalism that we're seeing now. It's not like just this insurgency that's come in. Like they've really empowered, um, really polarizing figures like Ilhan Omar and mm -hmm. Rashida Tlaib. So uh, they played with that fire, and they're getting burnt now. Um, so it's of their own doing. So walk me through. You're in the middle of um, one of these um, rallies, protests, whatever you want to call them. And you start seeing violent type stuff bubbling up. You've been in the middle of this so many times. You know, the human, uh, I think, reaction to that is to you know, escape the situation. You want to get, at, you want to get, get yourself the hell out of the way. Um, you don't do that, really. I mean, you, you, you make sure that people can see what's going on. What led you to the point where you, you decided, this is too important. I, I'm going to risk my own health to go in there and look at these situations and make sure that people can see what's going on. So what was really frustrating to me throughout 2016, 17, 18 is that the way that Antifa's violent actions were being covered in the local media, which the national media then used to frame the narrative, was that mm -hmm. these were people just defending their communities and they were largely peaceful. When what, what I was witnessing, what was really happening is um, people, masked individuals, attacking people, sometimes unprovoked, destroying properties, and getting away with it. And so um, the local media, because it, it can be really dangerous, what they, they don't really embed their journalists in the middle of these violent demonstrations anymore, understandably. Um, me being uh, a risk taker and perhaps naive, I went in and have continued to cover it. It's come at a heavy cost. Um, yeah. You alluded to um, me getting beaten and by a mob uh, last year, and I was left with traumatic brain injury. So it's just uh, I've become a very strong advocate for uh, independent journalists, citizen journalists, because these are the people who are going out. They don't have a security team. They have no budget. They're going out and they're recording these clips that provide the true story of what's happening at some of these left-wing demonstrations. Seriously, thank you for all the work you're doing. This is, uh, this is something, a story that needs to be told. And as you point out, not a lot, a lot of people are telling it. So thank you for sticking your neck out, and unfortunately, literally, and, uh, and doing this for the country. Thanks for having me on. All right, back in a second. If you're watching Blaze TV, you're seeing me posing with a cardboard cutout of Nancy Pelosi. And I want to thank Benny Johnson for inviting me to the Turning Point USA party, as you might expect with a Bernie, uh, with a Benny Johnson party. Uh, it was a lot of fun, and this unfortunately happened towards the end of it. I'm at CPAC right now, and I have, uh, I found a friend. Uh, here she is. Now, I will tell you <laughs> that, uh, I, and I apologize to Benny Johnson right now. I, I've... I've apprehended Nancy Pelosi <laughs> from your party, and I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have done it. I, look, I'll be honest about it. It was not a good idea, but here she is. It was a good idea. Uh, insurance recovered, and uh, I'll say uh, Nancy Pelosi sucks pen.com. Sadly, uh, that did actually make it to the Trump Hotel later that night. Uh, we have a picture, I believe, of, of, of me walking out by the sign. I do not remember this picture being taken. Good night, America. <laughs>